Right, it's all gone quiet out there. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's lovely to see you out at church this morning. We're glad that you're here with us, whether in the room, uh, here in Strait, or at home uh, on Zoom. And we know there are those who join us regularly uh, through that uh, means as well. So you're so welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, we're delighted to have Alistair and Sharon with us this morning as well, and Alistair will be sharing uh, God's Word both this morning and this evening and next week as well. So welcome to you all. We're going to start this morning by singing. Okay, so our first hymn is Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning, Savior, Master, King, Lord of Heaven, Our Lives Sustaining, Hear us as we sing. So let's stand and sing this together, uh, praising the Lord. Okay, that was great singing, and thank you to our music group for uh, being with us this morning as well. We're going to read now from Psalm 17. So I'll give you a moment if you like to look that up and read along. Otherwise, it's on the screen, and we're going to read the whole psalm together. Hear, O Lord, my righteous plea. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. May my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart and examine me at night, though you test me, you will find nothing. 
I have resolved that my mouth will not sin. As for the deeds of men, by the words of your lips I have kept them. I have kept myself from the ways of the violent. My steps have held to your paths, my feet have not slipped. I call on you, O God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me and hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand. Those who take refuge in you from their foes, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who assail me, from my mortal enemies who surround me, they close up their callous hearts and their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down. They now surround me. With eyes alert to throw me to the ground, they are a lion hungry for prey, like a great lion crouching in cover. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, bring them down. Rescue me from the wicked by your sword. O Lord, by your hand, save me from such men, from men of this world, whose reward is in this life. You still the you still the hunger of those you cherish. Their sons have plenty, and they store up wealth for their children. And I, in righteousness, I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So, a psalm here that really uh, David is asking for help from the Lord. He says, Hear, O Lord, my righteous plea. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. And as we're about to turn to prayer now, it's a challenge because he says, my prayer doesn't rise from deceitful lips. Um, he talks about how though you probe my heart and examine me at night, though you test me, you will find nothing. And we know that as we meet this morning, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't do anything without Him. We do need Him. Um, we need Him to help us, to listen to us, to hear our prayers. But as we turn to God in prayer, we need to examine ourselves as well and ask if there's any unrighteousness or sin that we need to confess to God as we come to Him. So let's turn to prayer now and ask God to help us during our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this Sunday morning, we can come together as your family to meet with you, Lord, and to share in fellowship with one another. We thank you for the opportunity this morning to sing your praises as we've just been doing, to pray together, to hear your word, both read and shared. And Father, we ask this morning that you would hear our prayer and speak to us this morning. Father, we pray that you would examine us, Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in us, Lord. Father, we pray that you would cleanse our hearts afresh this morning. Father, we confess to you, Lord, that um, there are many ways in which, Lord, we uh, feel. We uh, give in to temptation, Lord. We let you down. And yet, Lord, we, we are thankful this morning, that if we confess our sins, Lord, you're faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, our Lord, at this time, we ask that you would cleanse us afresh, Lord, that, Father, we would rededicate our lives to you and ask, Lord, that you would move in our lives, Lord, 
Father, we pray for our service here this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us. And Father, we pray that when you speak, Lord, we would be as those who hear and listen and don't forget what you've had to say to us, Lord. Father, we ask that you be with each one who takes part in our service this morning. For Mike, as he brings the children's talk, for our musicians here, for those who are looking after the boys and girls in crash and in junior church. Lord, we thank you that all these rules, Lord, though different, are valuable and important part of the body of Christ. Lord, we pray for Alistair as he shares with us from your word this morning and then this evening. We ask again, Lord, that you would speak to us and bless us and help us, Lord. And so, Lord, we just commit this time to you, Lord, in your great wisdom and knowledge and power, Lord, and ask that your name would be glorified in all that happens here this morning. Amen. So I'm going to ask Mike uh, to come and speak to the boys and girls. Thank you, Mike. Okay, boys and girls, good morning. It's lovely to see you all this morning. I want to talk to you just for a wee minute this morning about something really, really exciting I was doing on Friday night. Some of you instantly know what that is. Some of you are smiling at me. Some of you even sent me a text message on Friday night because you were really excited as well. Boys and girls, does anybody know what I'm talking about? What big, important thing happened on Friday night? Does anybody know? I might, have to give you, I might have to give you a wee bit of a clue. On Friday night, there was a really, really big football match. And I mean a really, really big football match. We forget about the Premier League. We forget about the Champions League. We forget about the World Cup final. Even bigger than the World Cup final. On Friday night, Lauren had a big match. And on Friday night, Lauren became... Oh. Lauren became champions. Lauren became champions of the Irish League on Friday night. And it was so exciting because I was there and I got to see it. And here's, here's a picture. Here's a picture of some of the players after the match when they'd just become champions. And you can see the crowd in behind the players. And if you were able to zoom in, you would see my wee head with a big smile on my face standing in the crowd behind them after doing lots of shouting and jumping up and down. And getting really excited. So Friday night for me was a really, really, really exciting night because for the first time ever, Lauren became champions. Lauren Football Club have been around for 134 years and this is the first time that they have ever been champions. And just in case you don't believe me, just to gloat a little bit more, I'm going to show you the league table. Where are we? My wee clicker's not working this morning. Claire, move me on. There we go. There's, there's the league table. And there's Lauren sitting number one. Poor Chris is sitting in the front row there. Cole Rain sitting down at number six. They're not doing too bad. But Lauren are up at number one, miles ahead. Miles ahead of everybody. But it means, boys and girls, next weekend, something really strange is going to happen. Because next weekend, we have this match. Lauren have to play Linfield next weekend. Linfield are in second place. Lorne are already the champions, but when Linfield come to play against Lorne, it means next week there's going to be a really, really strange match, because Lorne are going to want to win. Linfield are going to come to Lorne, and they're going to play against Lorne, and all the Lorne players are still going to want to win. That means they're going to have to run really, really hard. They're going to have to chase really, really hard. They're going to have to tackle. They're going to have to try and pass the ball as best they can. They're going to have to try and score a goal whenever they get a chance to score a goal. They're going to have to fight, and they're going to have to chase, and they're going to have to run, and when they get tired, they're going to have to keep running, and they're going to have to do their best, and they're going to have to fight really hard to try to beat Linfield. But the thing is, boys and girls, Lauren are already the winners. They've already won the league. But next week, whenever Linfield come to play, they're still going to have to try really hard and fight and see if they can beat Linfield. But even before Linfield come, we already know that Lauren are the champions and Lauren are the winners. And that makes next weekend a bit, a bit of a strange game. Because Lauren are going to fight and they're going to try really, really hard to do their best and to win. But even before the game, they're already the winners. 
they're already the champions because we saw, we saw the pictures. They were all celebrating with me on Friday night, having a great time because they were the champions and they've won. And that's a bit of a strange situation. They're going to have to fight and try really hard next week, but they're already the winners, even if they don't win next week. And that's a bit strange. And it made me think a little bit about what it is like to be a Christian, boys and girls. And in the Bible, in the New Testament, lots of the books in the New Testament are written by a man called Paul. And Paul's job was that he would travel around, go into lots of different countries and go into lots of different places to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about how Jesus had died for their sins. And he would visit lots of churches and these were new churches that had just started up. And then after he left them, he would sometimes write them a letter. And lots of the books in the New Testament are Paul writing a letter to lots of different churches. And he's telling the people in these churches what it's like to be a Christian. And here's one of the things that he says about himself, about what it's like to be a Christian. He says, for the good, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And what Paul's saying is, even though I'm a Christian, even though I have asked God to take away my sins, even though God has forgiven me for all my sins, sometimes I still make mistakes. Sometimes I still get it wrong. He says that there are good things that he knows that God wants him to do, and he doesn't do them. And there are bad things that he knows that God doesn't want him to do, and he still keeps doing them. And maybe, boys and girls, you can say, I'm a wee bit like that sometimes as well. Because maybe you're a Christian, and maybe you've asked God to take away your sins, but when you're about to get in trouble in the house, and someone says, did you make that mess? Sometimes you still might tell a wee lie, and you still do something that you shouldn't do. Or maybe sometimes, whenever you're being told by your mum or your dad to go and do something, like go and tidy your room, you don't want to do it. And so maybe you pretend to go and do it, but you don't really do any tidying up at all. You just go and keep playing with your toys, and you don't do as you're told. And we do these wrong things that we know we shouldn't do. Or maybe you've eaten all of your Easter eggs, but your brother or sister still has a bit of Easter egg in the fridge, and you keep going to the fridge and breaking a wee tiny bit off it and stealing some of their Easter egg. And you know that there are things that you shouldn't do, and there are things that God doesn't want you to do, but you keep doing them anyway. And you know there are good things that you want to do and you, and you don't do them. And that's what Paul's saying, that when you become a Christian, it doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't mean that you stop sinning and you never get it wrong and you never make any mistakes. Because boys and girls, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in the Bible, that we are in a fight. That if you're a Christian, we're in a fight and that the devil still wants us to sin. The devil is out to get us if we're Christians. He wants to tempt us into sinning. And Paul writes in Ephesians that we are to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand up to the devil and we can fight against him. And Paul says that we still have to fight and we still have to try and we still have to work at it. And we have to do our best to do the things that are going to please God. And we have to do our best not to do the things that God doesn't want us to do. And that that's really hard and that's a fight. And it's difficult and we have to struggle and we have to try. But even though we're struggling and even though we're trying and we sometimes get it wrong, the Bible still tells us that we are, if we're Christians, if we have given our lives to God, we're on the winning side. It says in 1 John, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world through our faith in Jesus. If we're trusting in Jesus, we are, we are victors. If we've given our lives to Jesus, we have already beaten sin. We're on the winning side. And Paul writes again for me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has already fought against sin and won. Jesus has already fought against death and has won for us. So if we're Christians, we know that God has won for us. Jesus has won for us. And so on one hand, we're not perfect. If we're Christians, we're not perfect. We still do things that are wrong sometimes. We still make mistakes. 
We still sin. But on the other hand, we know that God has won for us and we are victors and we will, we will win against sin. That doesn't mean that we don't try. It doesn't mean that we just, we just give up and do, do whatever we want. The Bible says that God still wants us to fight. I would be really disappointed if Lauren turned up to play their match next weekend and they didn't even try anymore and they just said, sure, it's fine, we've won. We'll just, we'll just lose 10-0 now. It doesn't matter. We're the winners. We'll not even try. I'd be really disappointed. Even though our sins have been taken away and forgiven, God still wants us to try and to fight and to do our best to try to please him and to do our best to try to live for him and live in the way that he wants us to live. And it's a fight and it's hard work and it's a struggle. But we know that we win in the end because Jesus has won for us. But boys and girls, this morning, if you're just trying to be good by yourself, if you're just trying to do all the right things by yourself and not sin and be good all the time, and you're trying to get to heaven just by being good by yourself, you're going to lose because we can't do it. We only win when we have Jesus on our side. We only win whenever we have asked God to take away our sins and we're in the same team as Jesus because he has won for us. He is the one who has beaten sin. And so there's no good just trying to be good by ourselves. We have to turn to God and we have to ask him to take away our sins through what Jesus has done for us. So thank you for listening this morning. Thank you, Mike. And thank you very much for sharing with the boys and girls. Um, we're going to turn to the announcements now. So if you've got a wee announcement sheet, you maybe want to uh, look that out. Before we get into the actual announcements for this week, there's a couple of wee things I want to uh, mention. Um, it's uh, good to see Sam out today. And uh, I didn't manage to make it here uh, for the funeral on Friday, but thank you for all of those who helped uh, and uh, were involved with the funeral arrangements and I know there was tea and stuff served as well. So thank you for all who helped uh, with that. And uh, I know I've heard that it was a really a good service. And uh, yeah. Thank you also to those who made it uh, yesterday for the church and manse cleanup. We got a lot of things accomplished. Uh, it was a good morning and we had the sunshine. Uh, so that was nice as well. So thank you to all uh, who, who made it along for that. Uh, I see Joe and Anne here, and uh, you're so welcome uh, in our service this morning. I believe it's a long time since you've managed to get across to Northern Ireland, so uh, we're delighted you're with us in Strait this morning. So have a, take a moment and say hello to them after the service this morning. I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Um, quite a few wee things to mention here. Congratulations to Sammy and Judy, on birth of another granddaughter, I believe. So I think, is it Colin and Laura had a wee daughter, Ivy? So there you go, Ivy, another Ivy. Um, so congratulations to the two of you, and that's, that's wonderful news. Um, I have a wee letter here from Roy and Betty. I'm going to read out. Dear church family, we want to express our sincere thanks for all your love and prayers on both the passing of mum and on my recent illness. Thanks especially to those who sent cards, telephoned, or visited our home and for the flowers and gifts. This meant so much to us on both occasions. We have been very aware of God's presence during these past few months and despite some challenging days, are thankful for how God has kept his hand upon us. Thank you once again for remembering us and our family in your thoughts and prayers, Roy and Betty. So thank you for that note, Betty and Roy. Um, okay. So now to the announcement sheet. Okay, so today uh, we're, as I said already, we're really glad to have Alistair. Alistair's going to be with us at 6.30 this evening. So make an effort to join us uh, this evening. We would love to have you here. Looking ahead to this week, uh, there's a deacons meeting tomorrow night, which uh, everyone will be aware of. Mums and Tots is on Tuesday morning at 10.30. Uh, our prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. 
on the morning prayer time on Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Friday, we have our Pathfinders back on after a short Easter break, and we're coming towards the end of some of this youth work, so um, we look to the Lord for uh, that, and then for straight youth at 8.15 p.m. Um, next uh, Sunday morning, we have Sunday School and Sunday Fellowship, and uh, you know I always take the chance to plug Sunday Fellowship when I'm up here. Uh, so if you haven't made it along to Sunday Fellowship yet, and maybe you're somebody who uh, comes along to church, but you know you feel like you don't have a chance to maybe get to know other uh, people in the uh, congregation, that's a great way to do that. We meet here at 10.15, same time as Sunday School starts. There'll be some uh, food, tea, coffee in the wee room uh, just behind the hall there and uh, look at God's Word together. So you would, I'm sure, be blessed if you joined us next Sunday morning. Uh, Alistair is with us for both services next Sunday as well, and we're really delighted about that and looking forward to him sharing with us uh, through these four services. Looking ahead then, um, we have a members meeting on the 24th, so that's uh, just uh, uh, the week after uh, this week, uh, Sunday, uh, Monday the 24th of April at 8 p.m. So I think that's most of the things I needed to uh, mention in the announcements. Um, so we're going to sing uh, as well again together. And towards the end of this hymn, then the boys and girls can head up to junior church.
So uh, just as the boys and girls are uh, heading out, um, we, we will pray uh, once again just before uh, Alistair comes to us. Uh, just a couple of other wee things to mention to you. Some of you will know that um, Bethany, uh, Johnny and Catherine's Bethany, fell off a seesaw and broke her arm uh, in uh, the week there. Now she, she's had it casted and it looks all like it will be okay, but uh, just uh, to update you on that. Um, we're going to uh, remember Sam and the family in prayer here as well. Uh, also ask you to remember uh, uh, my granny, Mrs. Hall, at uh, this time, who's uh, fairly unwell in hospital and uh, unlikely to uh, uh, come through this. So um, we'll maybe just think of uh, some of these folk in prayer for a few minutes before Alistair uh, comes up. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you live, Lord Jesus, that you are risen from the dead and that you are Lord. And as we turn to you in prayer, we're praying to a risen Savior who knows all things, is aware of all the difficulties and problems that might be in our lives or in the lives of those around us that maybe we're not even aware of ourselves, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we can commit to you, Lord, uh, our brothers and sisters, Lord, to your care and keeping, Lord. Father, we uh, thank you for how you've been with those who have been going through times of difficulty in recent months, Lord. We think of Roy, Lord, and uh, how his health problems and the loss of his mother, Lord. Father, we uh, commit Roy to you, Lord, and ask that you continue to be with him and the family there uh, as well. Father, we thank you that um, Bethany was able to get her arm sorted this week, Lord. We do pray that, that she would uh, heal well, Lord, and make a full recovery, Lord, in the weeks that lie ahead, Lord. And we know it's challenging uh, when there's maybe not the same degree of uh, health care available to Johnny and Catherine. So we pray that you would help them in this situation as well. We're going to pray for Sam, Lord, and uh, the family, uh, the wider family at this time as well, as they mourn the loss of Barbara. Father, we uh, thank you for that time of remembrance and thanksgiving that was able to be held here on Friday, Lord. Thank you for those who uh, came into church, Lord, and heard the good news, who maybe haven't uh, heard or been in a church for many, many years, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would even use a time like this, Lord, to speak and to draw uh, those unto yourself, Lord, when maybe there wouldn't have been any other time they would have heard the good news or the gospel, Lord. And Father, I do want to pray for my own granny as well, Lord, who's very unwell at this time. Thank you for her life, Lord. Uh, we just pray that at this time you would Keep her comfortable, Lord, and uh, uh, not in distress, Father. And uh, pray for uh, uh, my mom and for uh, uh, Mavis and Valerie in particular as well, Lord, that you would be with them at this time. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that we can share these burdens together, Lord, but especially that we can share them with you, Heavenly Father. We do ask now, Lord, as we... Um, uh, hear what you have to say to us from your word, that you would be with Alistair. Help him, Lord, as he shares what you've laid on his heart, Lord, and through your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, each one, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Alistair. Amen. Thank you. Uh, John, for the kind words of welcome and the prayer before the service. Uh, all of that, we do um, appreciate that. So thank you very much and the invite to be here and uh, to share from uh, God's Word. That is also good. If you want to follow in the reading, then we're going to Acts chapter 17, please. Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 16 through to verse 34. And uh, we're going to look at that this morning, and then, God willing, 
uh, we will come back to the same portion next Sunday morning as well. So we'll spend the two uh, Sunday mornings looking at this in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through to 34. Again, just while you're looking that up, thank you for your prayers for us over the Easter period and for services that we had there in, in Yorkshire uh, and different areas. We do appreciate your prayers. So thank you for that, and please continue uh, to pray for us. We have a, a rally in Leyburn uh, on, on Easter Monday, and there's about a good 50 people at that, uh, and, and we certainly knew the Lord's help. But when, when you organize a service, you never quite know what, what might take place. And uh, I just say this, Joe McNeely and Anne will know who I'm speaking about, and if John and Irene Barfoot are listening online, they will know the people I'm talking about. But there was a little group of, of people, four in a car, uh, who traveled to, to be with us. Myrtle Bolden's a former mission worker. She was driving. She brought another lady called Maureen Pearson with her, and then a couple of others. One of them, a man called Brian. Now, I don't have many people in my fan club, all right? So my fan club is very small, but if I had anybody in it, Brian might be in it, because he would turn up here and there wherever I'm preaching, you know, not just in his own little place, but elsewhere. Oh, well, I knew you were there, and he'd just come along, and he'd have a little word, and, and off he'd go, a little man who was, was never married. So on the morning, Brian is traveling along with these ladies, and they stop in the services in for coffee, and Brian said, no, coffee's too dear in here. I'll not have any. Uh, and he just kind of wandered around. And the ladies went in for coffee, and you know what ladies do when they're in for coffee. They're in for a good while and whatever. But when they were ready to go, there's no sign of Brian. And then somebody says, no, someone has, has collapsed in, in, the, in the men's Lou. When they went outside, there was a couple of ambulances and a few people there. And eventually Myrtle went to the ambulance. He said, look, I brought a man with me called Brian. And uh, the ambulance guy said, maybe you should take a seat. Brian actually died uh, on, on the way to the meeting. Now, when he was there, the first person there was someone from RAF. They did all that they could do. Uh, but they couldn't, they couldn't save him. It was near RAF Leeming. They sent for the ambulance. It came from the RAF, and they were able to do more than maybe the normal ambulance might do. Still couldn't do anything about it. And that, that was a very, very sad note. On the way to, from, from his home to there, he was giving his testimony, talking about Easter, and just talking about the Lord. And you think, hey, what, what a great way to go, isn't it? Your last conversation's given testimony and talking about Jesus and you're ready to go. Now, for those who know Shirley and Maureen, they are strong believers, strong Christians. And uh, so they actually had to go to the ambulance and identify the body. So the ambulance guy there is kind of trying to be with them and say, well, you know, what are you going to do now? And can we help you? And Maureen, she said, we are Christians. And we're on our way to a Christian meeting. And we're going to carry on. He says, and we know Brian is fine because he's a Christian and he's in heaven. And we have no, no concerns. He's in no pain. And there's nothing that beats Christian fellowship. I thought, what confidence these elderly ladies have in the gospel. And what confidence it brings to us to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's not just something we know. But it's absolutely, absolutely vital. And we, we watched online Barbara's funeral and so on. And just thinking the confidence that we have, the peace we can have, because we know Jesus and know our sins forgiven. And none of us know the moment whenever the Lord will call us home. But to know we're ready to go. There's nothing like that, is there? So that certainly strengthened my, my, my thoughts in the gospel. Let's have a little prayer, and then I'm going to read this together uh, from Acts 17. Father, we just thank you for what the gospel means to us. We thank you, Lord, for the peace and the joy and the assurance that the gospel brings to us. 
We thank you for the hope that we have, that it's absent from the body, it's present with you. Lord, we just thank you. And we thank you this morning that we know the gospel and we know about Jesus. And we just praise you, Lord, for your grace, your great salvation. We just thank you. And Lord, now as we come to read this portion in your word and try to understand it, we ask, Lord, for the help of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you will be glorified. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 17, then verse 16. Luke is writing, and he says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, that is, while he waited for Timothy and Silas, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devices. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus, an Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Amen? And may the Lord bless to us the reading of uh, his word. Now, this is a little portion of scripture that just recently I've been working my way through and uh, preaching, preaching on, so that's, that's how I happen to come to it this morning and just praying about these services and praying about maybe just doing a couple of things together over the next Sundays, then I just kept coming back and back and back again to this little little portion. Now this portion is 
is a gem. Now, you have to be careful saying that about the Scripture. Sure, the whole Bible is a gem, and you have to be careful about picking out one little, little part. But, but this is an important little part, and it, and it is a gem, and worth looking at, thinking about, and studying, and trying to, trying to understand. I think it gives us some insight into the Apostle Paul, gives an insight into the things that moved him. It gives us some insight into the things that troubled him. It gives us some insight into how he went about his evangelism and how he went about sharing the gospel with others. And I think it gives us a confidence in sharing the gospel when we think about the context in which Paul was sharing this and preaching the gospel. And I think it gives us inspiration and encouragement to go on sharing the gospel and telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's, let's just look at this and try, and try and understand it. Now, when I was going to, to Sunday school, uh, I used to think that it would be great to be a Christian whenever Paul was around. I had got some notion in my head that everybody wanted to see Paul, and that wherever Paul went, almost everybody was converted. And if you could have been a Christian in the time of Paul, it would have been wonderful. So that was kind of my false notion at the time. I always thought this would, would be great. But when you begin to study Paul and you begin to look at, at what it was like for Paul to share the gospel, then you know that what I was thinking was just childish nonsense, really, and, and I just had picked it up wrong. So I want to show it kind of as, as a way of introduction and give a little bit of the background as to how, why Paul was at Athens and what Athens was like and hopefully help us just to kind of see the, the, the sort of conditions that Paul was sharing the gospel in. Paul went on three main missionary journeys. This is the second one, and on this missionary journey, he took with him a man called Silas. Along the way, they picked up another young man called Timothy, and they were traveling together and sharing the gospel from place to place to place. You can read about it, Acts chapter 16. And they're attempting to go into Europe, and they're attempting to go one place and another place, and so on. And it always seemed that the Lord had blocked, blocked the way and that they couldn't, they couldn't go. Then eventually Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia asking him to come. Come over and help us and share the gospel with them. And immediately Paul goes, and the door is open to them, and he goes to this place called Macedonia. It's an area to share the gospel. Now, it's roughly a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, so he's not exactly on the, on the doorstep there. He's traveled quite some distance. And he's taken the gospel to, to this place, Macedonia. It probably covers North Greece, Bulgaria, South Balkans kind of, kind of area. Kind of gives us a picture of, of where he was. Uh, there's churches in those areas that Paul has planted, so Philippians is in that area. Also, uh, Thessalonians is in that area. Some people count Corinthians, but I think that's further south in, in, in Greece and so on. Uh, and there's books written to churches that are planted in this area. It's mentioned in the Scriptures about Berea, where they really studied the Scriptures. It's in this area of Macedonia. And if you're looking kind of for something from history from it, then Alexander the Great came from Macedonia. Um, whatever, 350 years before Christ or so on. So it gives you kind of an idea of where Paul is. And he's there to preach because he has a vision of the Lord, uh, from the Lord saying, come over and, and help us. Paul and his friends go there and they start preaching the gospel. But as they do, not like my childish Sunday school thoughts, not everybody's happy to see Paul. Place after place, there's arguments and in one place he's dragged out of, the, out of the town and he's stoned and left for dead. And it's like a miracle when he arises and, and goes back into the city. And then they move to the next place and some come from the other villages and stir up trouble for him. Until it's trouble after trouble after trouble. And yet there are people that are converted and churches that are planted. But eventually, uh, Paul's friends get concerned for his safety. And they bring him to Athens and they leave him there for his own safety because there's been so much trouble and so much persecution. 
And you can read about that earlier in Acts chapter 17. Now they bring him to Athens and they leave him there. And when we picked it up, it says, and while Paul waited for them in Athens. So we kind of have the background and we know what's, what's happening. It doesn't say that anybody else was with him. It just says his friends, for his safety, took him to Athens, left him there, and he sent back word and said, look, send Timothy and Tylus, uh, Silas and Timothy back to me as soon as you possibly can. And he's waiting. So what do you do when you're waiting? I suppose if you were in a nice place like Athens, then what would you do if you're waiting? Now, maybe some of you have been to Athens on your holiday. Uh, I haven't been there. I've hardly been to Antrim on my holiday, never mind go to Athens. But you might have been there and you, and you know what it's, what it's like. So Paul's there waiting in this lovely city. Let me give you a little bit of background to it then. Athens may be the world's oldest inhabited city. Three or four hundred years before Paul was its heyday, around the time of Alexander the Great. It had many military victories. It's the first example in history of democracy. They had elected leaders. It was a place of literature and plays and philosophy. I no doubt you'll have all have studied, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. You'll know all that stuff. I mean, I could write all I know about that in the back of a postage stamp, but nevertheless, that's the place where they were. It was a place of culture and a place of learning. And, and that's where Paul was, waiting. A place of politics and religion. I suppose it would be something like going to Oxford or Cambridge or maybe going to Belfast and looking around Queen's University and the history and, and all that's there. And here's Paul in Athens with all this history, and he's looking around this lovely city. But what are the things that, that concern him? What does he observe? Verse 16 says, And he saw that the city was given to idols. Some ancient historians say that, that it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man. They had so many gods so many temples, so many altars to false gods. People were worshiping everything, anything. And as Campbell Morgan said, they're worshiping nothing. And how does Paul feel as he's in this city? It says his spirit is provoked within him when he saw that the city was given to idols. Provoked there means that he was stirred up. He was moved. He was greatly distressed. He was troubled. Even, I think, to the point of a kind of a, a, a righteous anger. Really troubled about the state of the people in the city of Athens. And he's moved. Like Jesus was often moved with compassion. Verse 17 gives us some kind of little insight in, and 18 into, into what the culture was really like. Therefore, when Paul was so moved by it, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. So there was a Jewish synagogue. And with the Gentile worshippers, so there were, there were others who were non-Jews who were worshipping. And in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So he's in the synagogue. He's with the Gentile worshippers. He's out into the marketplace and wherever he goes, he's reasoning with them and sharing with them about the gospel. And it tells us on down there, and we'll come to it in a moment, what he actually preached. Now, there's a couple of groups of people that are mentioned in verse 18. And if you're like me, you wouldn't have used these words very, very often. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Now, who were they? Let, let's have a little think about it very, very briefly, very quickly. It kind of helps us to, to see what it's like. So we'll just, a little insight, and we'll just a little uh, keep it brief. Now here's, here's, here's what they, they thought, and here's their chief goal for life. To attain the maximum amount of pleasure and the minimum amount of pain. 
There are a few Epicureans in straight. The maximum amount of pleasure, the minimum amount of pain. That's what they wanted. James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary, he gives a little, a little uh, mention to these guys, and he says, uh, here's, here's what they thought. This life is all that there is. You only go round once. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, stay away from it. And give your life to do the maximum amount of good that you can. Does that kind of sound familiar to the culture in which we live? If it feels good, do it. If it's not good, avoid it. But do as much good as you can in your life while you're here because you only go around once and that's it. That was their philosophy. A little more, they were, they were materialistic. Not exactly atheistic. They believed in celestial beings, angels, or whatever it happened to be, but that was just it. Enjoy yourself because this is all there is. So as Paul goes around Athens and he looks at what they're worshiping, he encounters a group of people like this. This is all there is. Do the best you can. Then there's another group called the Stoics. Now what are they? Well, basically, they may, they, maybe they were a little more realistic. Maybe not. They taught that life is filled with good and bad. And you can't avoid the bad. It's going to come to you anyway. So you've got to take it on the chin, as it were, and bear it stoically. We still use that word. I was thinking about this a few days ago, and then it comes up on the news about how somebody handled something stoically and so on. I'm thinking, oh, well, not much changes. You've got to take it. So what they're really saying is that they saw that self-mastery was the greatest virtue. I'm in control. I'm in control of how I handle it. I'm in control of how I handle bad things. I'm in charge of what I do. I'll react to it the way I want to react to it. I can deal with it. I can handle it. I can cope with it. That was their greatest virtue. Now, they had some beliefs as well. They were uh, pantheists, which means there was no distinct personal God. It was like God is in the world, the cosmos, and the world is in God, and we're in God, and God is everywhere, but God is no distinct person. So, if you want to try and get your head around like the New Age kind of movement, then they were, they were kind of New Age people. Or if you want to look at Hinduism or Buddhism and those sort of Eastern religions, then, then they had a bit of this mixed in here with them. So you can take it. But they also believed if you got to a point where you couldn't take it, you had a right to take your own life. And it's not much different to the culture in which we live. What's the debate in Canada? Assisted suicide or whatever polite titles they put upon it. If you can't take it, you have a right to end it. Life's about the maximum pleasure, minimum pain. I'm in charge. And when I can't take it, I can finish it. You see, the truth of the matter is that human nature never changes. We're born in sin and shape and in iniquity. And left to ourselves generation after generation after generation, we come up with the same stuff. Because it's the same stuff that's at the very heart of human nature. So whether it's Paul in Athens looking at what they're worshiping and looking at how they're doing it, or it's you and I, human nature without Christ is human nature without Christ. Dead in sin, coming up with its own ideas, maybe giving it different titles and words, 
But at the core of it, if you drill down into it, it'll be exactly the same thing that they're believing. Now, Paul is in this city, moved by what they're doing, looking at what they're, what they're believing, moved to the point of, of righteous anger. And what does Paul do, the great apostle? Verse 18 says that he was preaching to them Jesus and the resurrection. And in fact, it says there they want to see what this proclaimer uh, this proclaimer of foreign gods. It's very possible that what they thought was that Jesus was one God and resurrection was another God. So Paul was talking about two gods. They made a God out of anything. And Paul's preaching to them about Jesus. So the city, Athens, the culture, just the same as what we see. But the Christ in which Paul is preaching into that culture. That's what encourages me about this passage, and as I was studying it through, to think what Paul, what Paul did. Now, I don't think that Luke here records all the whole sermon that, that, that Paul preached. I think he's given as the outline, if you like, or a snapshot, or, or a part of it, or, or the idea of it. Now, one other place where Paul was preaching, he preached all night, and somebody fell asleep. So, I don't think that this was probably all of Paul's all of Paul's sermon. But it's very interesting just looking at, at what he does. Now, it's, so it's very short. He preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And I found myself looking at this thinking, okay, well, wh what did he preach? If this culture is not much different than ours, what did he preach? And I began to kind of, well, have we any indication of what he was preaching? I thought, well, if we look back from Paul's conversion until this point, what did he preach? Because I'm sure he didn't preach anything different. So if you go back to Acts chapter 9, where Paul was converted on the Damascus road, it says in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ is the Son of God. So he's preaching to them, Christ is the Son of God. Verse 27 of chapter 9 says, Paul preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Chapter 13, it says that Paul preached that God raised up a Savior for Israel, Jesus. Chapter 13, verse 28 through 41, if you take time to read through that, it says that Paul preached that Christ was put to death by Pilate. It says Paul preached there also that they took down the body of Jesus from the tree and laid it in a tomb. Verse 30 says he was preaching that God raised him from the dead. He says that many were seen by him over many days and were his witnesses. And he's saying, verse 38, that this is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, that we should preach forgiveness of sins in Christ's name. And he preached, and if everyone who believe is justified, not by the law, not by the Jewish law, but by faith in Christ. And when we come into Philippians uh, I went to, to uh, Acts 16 and talk about the Philippian jailer. We're, we're familiar with that story. Paul and Silas are in jail for preaching Jesus, and at midnight they're singing songs of praise. There's an earthquake, and the prison guard thinks all the prisoners have disappeared, and he was going to kill himself. Paul says, no, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And he comes in and says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And then chapter 17, verse 3, it says, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Friends, in Athens, in such a sophisticated, educated society, in the midst of all their world religions and beliefs and philosophies, the Apostle Paul comes along and he preaches Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And that by faith in Jesus Christ, we will be justified and our sins will be forgiven. 
He preaches to them Christ. And if you get down to the end of the portion we read, and we'll come to that maybe more so next week, he also preached to them that God had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained and he's given assurance by raising him from the dead. Paul preached to these people the whole, the whole gospel, if you like. He preached to them Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his return, and his judgment. He preached Jesus in that culture. Friends, that's what we need to preach in our culture. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. Well, we might think our culture is more sophisticated than back in his day, but I doubt that it is. Just preach Jesus. Where did he preach it? Verse 17 says that he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. If you read through Acts and, and so on with Paul, he went there first, gospel to the Jews first. He would go to the synagogue. He would reason with the Jews. He would tell them the gospel. Then he went to the non-Jews that were worshipers, and he told them the gospel. He preached to them Jesus. And then he went out into the marketplace, and he preached to them Jesus. I, I, I love those few words uh, uh, where it says at the end of verse 17, with those who happen to be there. If you sort of look up the meaning of what Paul was saying here, it's this. To those that he could fall in with, to those that he could meet with, those that he could even have a chance meeting with. So Paul's walking around Athens, moved by what he sees, and he preaches the gospel to the Jews, the Gentiles, and with anybody that he could happen to fall in with and have opportunity to speak to, he preaches Jesus. Does that not encourage us to go out and preach Jesus with whoever we happen to fall in with? Whoever they are, wherever they are. Does that not encourage us to preach Jesus in our church services and to keep that foremost and to the, to the fore? We're preaching the gospel about Jesus. And wherever we happen to be. Now, if that's the case, then this morning it's my responsibility to preach to you Jesus. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? There's a moment, a time, a point, a day, a night, a realization where you've come to this point and you say, I, I need Jesus as my Savior. You see, you can know about it in your head. And actually, you can agree about it in your head. You put up no argument. But actually, we've just never done anything about it. And I have a notion that that's probably where most people who come along to church and are not converted are at. They agree. They appreciate it. And in a mental sort of capacity, they, 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 you know, they believe it. And maybe just maybe someday intend to, to do something about it. But actually just, well, sure, I'll see what it is next week. Well, it's not very helpful at the moment, you know, the be like John the cow's calving or the sheep are lambing. And when I get through this busy time, I'll maybe just do it. And we kind of just kick it down the line a bit further. Now listen. This is absolutely dead serious. There comes a point when you've heard it the last time. For the last time. 
just mental agreement with it doesn't do it. You've actually got to come to the point and say, yes, I do believe that. And yes, I do need Jesus as my Savior. And Lord, will you be my Savior? Will you become my Savior? Will you forgive my sins? Will you make me your own? Lord, will you be my Savior? You know, I, I always feel a serious weakness as a preacher when you come to this point. If I could come down there somehow or other and, and in some sort of way physically carry you across the line to, to make you believe, then I would, I would come down and do it, but I can't. God so loved the world, He gave a Son that whosoever would come to Him wouldn't perish. It's an individual thing. And you've got to respond individually. You can't come as a family. Maybe all the rest of your family are converted, and, and you're the one who's not. You come as an individual to Jesus Christ, and you trust Him for yourself. Have you done that? If you haven't done that, you can do this morning, and you should do this morning, and I, I urge you this morning from the Scriptures. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the only day we're guaranteed. Today's the day. If you've never trusted Jesus, then why not this morning when opportunity avails? I can't answer that. Only you can. And secondly, for those of us who do know and have trusted Jesus Christ, what effect does a passage like this have, have upon us? Are we moved by what we see in our culture? I'm as guilty as anybody else of just getting used to it, familiar with it, fit into it, accept it, and don't get stirred up by it. Are we moved by what we see? Are we moved by what the media puts out to us? And they were basically just putting out the stuff that was around for Paul. Are we moved? Let's not just accept the thing. But we're moved. Moved to pray. Moved to share the gospel and just to preach Christ. Moved to be out there. Just to talk about Jesus. And have a confidence to share Jesus. I think that's what... what one of the things that this portion did for me. Here's Paul, one man in a huge city filled with philosophy and false religion. And he just went out and told them about Jesus. You can go out and tell people about Jesus. I can tell people about Jesus. And if we really see people as lost, unless they know Jesus, then we'll be moved to do it. Are we willing to say, as Paul said in Acts 9 when he was first converted, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he went out and did it. The city in which Paul preached, Athens. The culture in which Paul preached, well, all these religions and belief systems. The Christ whom Paul preached, he went out and preached Jesus. And the very last verse, the response to Paul's preaching some mocked. That will happen to us. Maybe in family, or at school, or at uni, in the workplace, in the community. Oh, oh, forget it, would you? Some will mock. Some will be polite and say, well, I'd like to hear you again, you know. Well, maybe Alistair will hear you next Sunday if you're going to finish this. You don't know if you'll be here next Sunday. I'm going to finish it. Maybe I'll not be here to finish it next Sunday either. But some believed. Some believed. Some trusted Jesus. It's very important man, Dionysus. And a lady. 
and others. Some believed. Well, better, we better finish for now. Are you a believer? Have you trusted Christ for yourself? If not, why not this morning? You must, you must have some very good reason as to why you wouldn't trust Jesus this morning. In the comfort of this church, with a group of people who are with you, with the ease in which you could do it, you must have some very good reason as to why you would not trust Jesus. And for those of us who do know Christ, let's go out this week and see where we can share Jesus. Because we're moved by the culture in which we live. But have confidence that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation to all who will believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for people who shared with us the Lord Jesus. And maybe they shared it in a way in which they were trembling or wondered how we would take it or what response they would get. But they took the opportunity and they taught, to, taught us and shared with us Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, was the power, your power unto salvation for those of us here this morning who've trusted you. And thank you, Lord, it's exactly the same for any this morning who haven't, that they can come and trust you right now. And I ask, Lord, and I know there's others praying with me, Lord, I ask for any that has not yet trusted you, that maybe this morning they would, and Lord, for those of us who know you, help us not to be ashamed to share the gospel with whoever we can happen to come in contact with. Help us to share with them Jesus. And Lord, use it in our country and in our culture, we pray. We commit these things to you, Lord. Bless us in the singing of our final song. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I didn't pick the, pick the song, but it's a good song. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Let's stand to, to sing once the musicians get in, in place and get started. Thank you. Let's stand please to see.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for these truths. Thank you, Lord, for these truths, the greatest truths ever proclaimed. And thank you that we know them this morning. Lord, you have blessed us abundantly in revealing Jesus to us. Father, we thank you. We commit ourselves to you. We ask you to take us to our homes in safety. Pray that we will know your presence with us this day. And Lord, we commit the evening meeting to you. And again, ask you to draw near to us. And may you be glorified. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.